I want to start off today's sermon. We're starting a new, we're still in the book of Ephesians, but we're starting a new sermon series in this called Armor Up, and it's mainly on Ephesians 6. But I want to start today's sermon with a one of my favorite radio personalities of all time. I'd like to quote him this morning. And it's from Earl Pitts, and he says, Wake up, America! I just want to make sure you wasn't asleep, but we really, we need to wake up. And I want to talk about the year 1941. And this was a time when America was asleep. Uh, 1940 was a pretty good year for America. There was a war, uh, war raging, but it was oceans away. And we sat over here and thought we couldn't be affected by that. When in reality, in January of 1941, Japan started to plan against the United States. I have a timeline here. Uh, January, Admiral Yamamoto of the Japanese Navy begins communicating with other Japanese officers about a possible attack on Pearl Harbor. January 27th, Joseph C. Grew, the U.S. ambassador to Japan, wires Washington that he has learned that Japan is planning a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. February, Admiral Husband E. Kimmel assumes command of the U.S. Pacific Fleet in Hawaii. Kimmel and Lieutenant General, Lieutenant General Walter C. Short, commanding general of the Hawaiian Department, prepare for defense of the islands. April. U.S. intelligence officers continue to monitor Japanese secret messages in a program codenamed MAGIC. U.S. intelligence uses a machine to decode Japan's diplomatic dispatches. Washington does not do communicate all the available information to all commands, including Short and Kimmel in Hawaii. May. Japanese Admiral Nomura informs his superiors that he has learned the Americans are reading their message traffic. No one in Tokyo believes the code could be broken. July. Throughout the summer, Admiral Yamamoto trains his forces and finalizes the planning of the attack on Pearl Harbor. September 24th. The, the bomb plot message from Japanese naval intelligence to Japan's Council General in Honolulu requesting a grid of exact locations of ships in Pearl Harbor is deciphered. The information is not shared with Hawaii's Admiral Kimmel or General Short. November, Tokyo sends an experienced diplomat to Washington as a special envoy to, ins to assist Am Ambassador Nomura, who continues to seek diplomatic solutions. Japan wants the U.S. to agree to its southern expansion in Asia. November 16th, submarines, the first units involved in the attack, depart Japan. November 26, the main body, aircraft carriers, and escorts begin to transort, transit to Hawaii. November 27, Kimmel and Short receive a so-called war warning from Washington indicating a Japanese attack, possibly on an American target in the Pacific. Night of December 6, morning of December 7, U.S. intelligence decodes a message pointing to Sunday morning as a deadline for some kind of, a, of Japanese attack. The message is delivered to Washington High Command before 9 a.m., more than four hours before the attack on Pearl Harbor, but the message is not forwarded to the Pearl Harbor commanders and finally arrives only after the attack has begun. At 0700 Hawaiian time, the first wave of Japanese aircraft begin the attack. Along with the ships in Pearl Harbor, the air stations of Hickman, Wheeler, Ford Island, Kanoa, and Ua Field are attacked. The Japanese attack continues for two hours and 20 minutes. When it's over, more than 2,400 Americans are dead. Nearly 1,200 women wounded. 18 ships have been sunk or damaged. More than 300 aircraft are damaged or destroyed. Finally, on December 8, President Roosevelt addresses Congress and asks for a declar declaration of war against Japan, which he receives. Almost a year, or probably more than a year, after Japanese first planned the attack on the United States, is war finally declared upon Japan. 
And all through this process, America sat over here and they found out information against the war against them, but they kind of they kind of put it over to the side and didn't really pay attention to it. They felt safe and secure, and they wasn't really worried about these little messages or these little soft voices they was hearing. And all the time, Japan is planning this attack and planning this attack and planning this attack. And then finally, it comes to fruition. And not until over a year after war had actually started against the United States did America realize that it was at war? One thing I found really interesting, that through this whole year, that Japan had diplomats in the United States telling lies, spreading falsehoods, trying to keep the United States' eyes turned away from what was really going to happen. And not until the bombs started bursting in Pearl Harbor did we realize we is at war. Wake up, America. And I think if Paul was here today, he would say, wake up, Christians. You're at war right now. I read C.S. Lewis. He has a collection of letters called the Screw Tape Letters. And it's a I'm going to read some excerpts, but before that, you got to kind of know they're, they're from a demon named Screwtape to his nephew named Wormwood. And in here, he talks about the patient, which is the human that Wormwood is out to destroy. And through these letters, you'll hear him refer to the enemy, and he's talking about Jesus Christ. He's talking about God through these. And through these letters, He's trying to teach his young demon nephew on how to wage war against the patient, against this person, and trying to sway him away from Christianity and towards hell and towards the devil. The very first letter starts off this way. I note, this is from Screw Tape to Wormwood. I note what you say about guiding your patient's reading and taking care that he sees a good deal of his materialist friend. But are you not being a trife naive? It sounds if you suppose that argument was the way to keep him out of the enemy's clutches. And he goes on here to talk that, that arguing's not the way to go, that, that that is a way to bring humans to reality, that you don't want to argue with them. You just want to kind of cloud their judgment. You want to kind of twist the words. He goes on to name one of their weapons here. He says, but what with the weekly press and other such weapons, we have are largely altered that. Then he talks about how they use the newspapers to confuse people on reality and they don't look at real science that, that proves the existence of things that are unseen. But he wants us humans focused on things that we can see and we are familiar with so that the reality of the invisible becomes untrue to us. He says, your business is to fix his attention on the stream. Tell him that real life isn't actually real. And don't let him ask what he means by real. He says, do you begin to see the point Thanks to the process which we set at work in them centuries ago, they find it all but impossible to believe in the unfamiliar while the familiar is before their eyes. Keep pressing home on him the ordin ordinarius of things. Above all, do not attempt to use science. I mean the real science as a defense against Christianity. They will positively encourage him to think about realities he can't touch and see. There have been sad cases among modern physicists. If he must dabble in science, keep him on economics and sociology. Don't let him get away from the invaluable real life. Do you do remember you are there to confuse him? From the way some of your, you and your young fiends talk, it would, you would suppose it's your job to teach. I find the second letter... Very interesting where he talks about the church. 
He says, one of our greatest allies at the present is the church itself. The church is the ally of demons? Do not misunderstand me. I do not mean the church as we see her spread throughout time, all time, all space, and rooted in eternity, terrible as an army with banners. That, I confess, is a spectacle which makes our, makes our boldest tempters uneasy. But fortunately, it is quite invisible to these humans. All your patient sees is the half-finished sham Gothic erection on the new building estate. When he goes inside, he sees the local grocer with rather an oily expression on his face bustling up to offer him one shiny little book containing a liturgy which neither of them understands and one shabby little book containing corrupt texts of a number of religious lyrics, mostly bad and in very small print. When he gets to the pews and looks around them, he sees that selection of his neighbors whom he has hitherto avoided. You want to lean pretty heavily on those neighbors. Make his, fine, make his mind focus uh, on an expression like the body of Christ, and the actual face is in the next pew. It matters very little, of course, what kind of people that, next, that are in the next pew. You may know one of them as a great warrior on the enemy side. No matter, your patience, thanks to our Father below, is a fool. Provided that any of those neighbors sing out a tune or have boots that squeak or double chins or odd clothes, the patient will quite easily believe that their religion must therefore be somehow ridiculous. At his present stage, you see, he has an idea of Christians in his mind, which he supposes to be spiritual, but within fact is largely pictorial. His, his mind is full of togas and sandals and armor and bare legs, and the mere fact that the other people in the church wear modern clothes is a real, though of course an unconscious, difficulty to him. Never let it come to surface. Never let him ask what he expected them to look like. Keep everything hazy in his mind now, and you will have all eternity wherein to amuse you by producing in him a peculiar, peculiar kind of clarity that hell affords. Here, when his patient becomes a Christian and goes into church, he wants him focused on what the neighbor's doing or what the neighbor looks like. He don't want him focused on what's really going on, what in reality that you have a gathering of the saints, that you have the body of Christ that Jesus himself established, that no demon, no anything can ever tear down. That he says that no weapon ever formed will prevail against. He wants you focused on distractions, looks, everything else. That you're not good enough. And he goes on through these letters. Uh, the, a few of the things I want to point out in these letters that the demons use that are at war against us here. He uses our patience with others in our house. He goes against prayer, and he talks about how he wants them to believe that prayer should produce feelings, not to rea realize the reality that when you're praying to God, that you're, he's storing these prayers up, he's hearing these prayers, and they're starting to change things. He wants you to focus on that no matter how hard or how long or you pray to God Almighty, the creator of the universe, that you still have these feelings inside you and that these don't change these feelings and that your prayer must be ineffective since you still feel like you don't belong or you still feel like you're not worthy or you still feel guilty despite you've confessed what your sins are and you've repented from them. He wants you to focus on your feelings and not in the reality of things. He, war he warns wor uh, Wormwood against suffering. He says not to, concut, not to start this. He says that the best weapon they have against humans is making them content in worldly things. He says, watch out in times of wartime that even, I want to quote him here, that even a human accepts the reality that they're not going to live forever in the middle of wartime. But he wants his patient to think that his life on earth is untouchable. 
He wants his patient to focus on patriotism. He wants Christianity and the patient side to be second to country and duty. He wants to say, well, Christianity is kind of one of those things that goes along with being a countryman. The list goes on and on. You can read the screw tape letters, and it will give you insight how the war's been raging against you. Before the bombs are ever dropped, before the patient he actually dies in World War II, how the war was going on against him. Because we won't wake up. We don't think that the war's being raged against us until we lose our job. We don't realize the war's been raging against us for months and months that uh, the devil and demons have been putting ideas in our head like we shouldn't be working like Jesus is watching. He's not really watching, is he? You're not really supposed to do your work to Jesus. You're supposed to do it to the guy that hands you the paycheck. And it's not till we lose our job do we think the war is actually going on, but it's been happening against us all the time. We don't think the war is against us kids, right, until we actually get punished, till we actually get grounded. We don't realize that there's been voices in our head telling us we shouldn't obey our parents, we shouldn't listen to what they have to say for months and months before we actually get in trouble. Parents, we don't think we're at war until our kids actually run away. We don't realize that we've been playing to our emotions, using anger to guide us in our parenting. We don't realize the war's been against us for months and months until it's too late. We don't realize the war is against us until our marriage is about to break and dissolve. We don't realize that the devil's been putting thoughts in our heads, women, that that we shouldn't respect our husbands, that he's not worthy of that, and we shouldn't listen to what he has to say. Men, we don't realize the war's against us until our wife's ready to leave, that, that we shouldn't sacrifice our lives for our wives, that we should feed into all the materialistic things this world wants us to dive into. That we should find happiness and sacrifice in the things we like and not our wives. We don't realize the wars against us until we've fallen to addiction. We don't realize the wars against us until someone commit suicide, as tragic as it is, when for years and years we've been believing the lies that we're not worthy to be children of God. We've been believing the lies that we can't really be forgiven of all our sins. We've been believing the lies for years and years God's forgot our past, and he sees us now as children. War is here, and it's upon you. And we need to wake up. Just because we're sitting here, and our marriage is going well, or our job is going well, maybe our checkbook's doing good, whatever it is, Don't think that the devil rests for a minute in your life. Don't wait for the war to explode on your doorstep before you realize this. And if you're going to realize that you're at war, you need to know who your enemy is. And this is where we're at in the book of Ephesians. For Paul says here in verse 12, 6, 12, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. 
We're not at war against other humans. But things that are much more powerful than that, rulers, powers in high places. We're not at war against our husbands, our wives, our children, our parents, our co-workers, or our bosses. But we're about those that come to us in the time when we have our guard down and we're not focused on the realities of life as a Christian. Some things you need to know about the devil. Who is the leader of all these things you're at war against? There's a description of him in Ezekiel 28. And he's beautiful. Garnished with all kinds of stones and beauty. Things you're at war against, they're not ugly. You're not going to notice them. You're going to think they're wonderful. You're going to think they're beautiful. When the devil comes at you, it's going to sound so sweet. His voice is described as music, the most beautiful music. That was his job, was to be head of all worship to God before he fell. When he came to Adam and Eve in the garden, they wasn't scared. They didn't run. They didn't know war was about to be waged against them. They listened to what he said. It sounded good to them. He wanted them to have what they wanted. That's the kind of war you're against right now. In 1 Corinthians, Paul calls the devil a tempter. He's here to tempt you. You want to know when you're at war? When you're being tempted with sin of hate, lust, anger, maliciousness. Anytime you're being tempted by something like that, you're being attacked. Jesus talked about the devil in the book of John. He called him a murderer and a liar. He says that he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That the devil, he wants to tempt you with stuff that looks good, sounds good, and appeals to your mind. But his intentions are bad. He roars around like a lion, like a lion waiting to devour. The devil, he's beautiful, he's powerful, he sounds good, he tempts us. And when he gets a hold of us, our face, our fate is not good. But there's a lot of things the devil's not. The devil is not all-knowing. He is not all-powerful. He is not with us all the time. He's not everywhere. He can only be in one spot at one time. The devil... He has not created a family for you to belong in. He's not created a family that he predestined you for. He's not called you or elected you to be part of his family. The devil does not make you alive in this family. He does not. He wants you to think that you're alive all the time. He wants you to not realize that you're dead in your sin and trespasses. He does not make you alive in that family. He wants you to believe lies. He wants to cloud your vision. He does not reveal all the mysteries. He does not make everything clear and certain for you. He does not have a love for you that you'll never understand that you can't measure and then what you get little bitty glimpses of this great great love that it'll blow your mind the devil did not create a family for you to grow up in to be nurtured in to be matured in and then once you're matured to get up and go to work 
The devil does not breathe life into your dry bones. He does not put skin and flesh on your bones and make you alive in his family where you can come as a child and you can walk as the wise and not the unwise. You can walk as the alive and not the dead. He does not create a family for you where you can come and walk in the light and know all the truth. He does not create marriage for where a man and a woman can come together and be bound in the image of God. Where two very different creatures can live together in the best relationship that you will ever see. The devil does not give you children or parents to love and to grow up and to experience the family of God on earth. The devil does not give you instructions on how to have a peaceable life in the workplace. He doesn't teach you how you should work or be a boss. He does none of them things. But there is one who does. And that's what Paul wants to say here. He says, finally, because all these things I just talked about is what Paul's been leading up through through the book of Ephesians about life in the family, what it looks like, how you're alive, how there's a love for you in this family that you cannot measure, that, that's uncomprehendable, that you can be alive in Christ, that you've got a place to belong, a place to mature, a place to be loved, that he will see you through every aspect of life, through your marriage, through your parenting, through your work. And Paul says here in Ephesians 6, 10, finally, Paul would be saying, wake up, Christians. Be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. He doesn't tell you to be strong in yourself or be strong in your wisdom or how smart you are or what you can do. But he says to be strong in God. Know all these things. Know that he's created a family for you to belong in. That he's done all this for you. He's done all these things the devil can't do. He's he's given you wisdom into your marriage. He's given you wisdom into your family. He's given you wisdom into your workplace where you can survive despite all these temptations that comes in the secret, that comes in the dark. That you got a place to be alive in. You need to know that your strength has to come from God. It cannot be your own. Paul says, wake up. Be strong in the Lord. Be strong in His might. Put on His armor. Not your own. If you're going to be strong in the Lord, if you're going to work in His strength, you need to know who He is. You need to know that your Lord sent plagues to a nation that had held His people captive. You need to know that this Lord rescued His people from that nation, that He parted a sea so that His people could walk across it on dry land. And he closed, in his strength, he closed that sea on the army that was after them. That he took his people through the wilderness for 40 years, led them, fed them bread from heaven. You need to know that this Lord, where you get your strength, where you get your might from, that he took his people into a foreign land, that they marched against a great city with these huge walls named Jericho, and that as they marched and blew trumpets, he's so strong that through that, he brought the walls down and the people defeated the city. You need to know 
that he took them people from that city and threw, put, the, put a bunch of people who had spent their lives of being slaves and wandering through the wildernesses and everything else, and he defeated one of the greatest armies ever put on the face of the earth. That included giants. That this Lord, where you find your strength and your might, took a coward named Gideon and 300 measly men against an army that was numbered like locusts. It says they had so many camels you couldn't even count them. But he took Gideon and 300 guys and some jars made into torches and some horns and killed every one of them without raising a sword. That that's how strong he is. And that if you're going to fight this fight and you're going to wake up to this war, you got to be strengthened in his might. You need to know that he took a short, small, young boy, the least in his family, named David. That he took this, this weak, sheep herding boy gave him a slingshot and five stones and he struck down the mightiest giant that ever walked on the face of the earth probably. You need to know the devil and what he looks like and how his henchmen come at you. It's usually not visible. You're not usually paying attention when it happens. That it's happened to you years before you realize it. You need to know those things. So you can be aware and you can be strong in God Almighty and you can put on his armor that protects you from all this. You need to know that you won't make it. You are dead in your sins. If you've never accepted him and you've never got strong in his might, that you're dead, that you're walking around this earth dead in your sins, headed for eternity, the same place where this devil is headed and all his demons, that that war that he thinks is going on, it's all but finished, that God's just waiting for a time to get rid of him. But you don't have to work out of your own strength or who you are or your own might. That you can come to this God and he's created a family for you to belong and he'll fight your wars for you. And I ask at this time of invitation that you stand up. And as we pray... I'd ask you to search your heart. Are you at war? Are you listening to all the voices you shouldn't be listening to? Are you following the way, the truth, and the life? Or are you following your feelings? Or where you think you should be? The things you, should, you think you should be doing? Because they're probably not right. They're probably not coming from somebody who cares about you. They're probably coming from someone who's looking to kill, steal, and destroy everything you have. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for an awakening, God, that we can look up and that we don't become restful or peaceful in where we're at, God, but we realize we are at war and that there are many things in the, on this earth that demons and the devil are real and true that he wants to devour us like a lion, God. Wake us up to this reality. But may we put on your armor. May we be strong in your might, Father. Uh, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the one who can defeat them all, who will defeat them all, and is defeating them all. God, may you turn our eyes towards you. May we listen to your word and the truth and not to this world or demons or anything else father help us to let go of ourselves and be united in your family forgive us for when we fall short it's in your son's name i pray